Let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, many of us in this room and watching online are weary. We're tired of things that we see on TV. We're tired of rumors that we hear. We're tired of pain. We're tired of suffering. We're tired of loss. We're tired of not feeling like we are accepted by others or by you. We are tired, Lord God, and we are weary. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray that through this time as we open up your word and we talk about who you are from John chapter 10, I pray that you would invite us again to come home and to sit with you and to dwell with you and to listen to what you have for us today, Lord God. May you transform us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Good to see all of y'all today. I hope that you're having a great year of 2023 so far, and I hope that you are reading through the Gospel of John with us in our dwell readings. They're not very lengthy, but it's a great little touch point uh, for following Christ and spending time with him. And the Gospel of John is a great book of the Bible. There's so many famous quotations in the Gospel of John. Right? There's, there's, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is the, the thief steal, uh, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. John 3.16, fun fact, is in John. So that one's in there. There is one, uh, 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 I guess, piece of wisdom that I have used in my life that is not found in the Gospel of John. And it's talking about someone or something's usefulness. And it's, that's about as helpful as a screen door on a submarine. I know, I was just as surprised as you to find that not be in the Gospel of John. But it's not in there because they didn't have submarines back then, I think. The saying is there to talk about the fact that that something's not helpful if it doesn't do what it's set out to do. A door is supposed to provide protection and it's supposed to provide access, right? Right? Otherwise, you would just have walls up everywhere. And so when you're in a submarine, and I feel like really stupid explaining this because it's kind of obvious, but when you're in a submarine, a screen door just lets all the water in, right? That's why it's not helpful. Either you don't need it or it's not going to do the function that it's supposed to do. And many of us in our lives, in our personal lives, in our professional lives, in our heart, in our commitments, we've got a lot of screen doors that go up especially in places where we're underwater, where we're struggling, where we're hurting, or maybe places where we've been hurt in the past and we're trying to, to make up for it. We're trying to, to protect ourselves. And we, so we put up things like success or we put up things like money or we put up things like, uh, uh, like addictions or we put up things like being a good churchgoer. And we're like, yeah, this will protect me. This will make me satisfied. This will make me safe. And this will give me access to all the good things that I want in my life. And then we're surprised when the water just keeps coming in. You're putting up screen doors in a submarine. And what I want us to talk about today, we're walking through the I am statements of Jesus, which there's seven of them in the Gospel of John. And it's one way that we kind of organize and understand what the Gospel of John is about. And this week we are talking about I am the door. It's in John chapter 10. We'll start in verse 1. And I want, us to sh- I want us to look at the fact that Jesus wants to come in and he doesn't want to fix your doors. He doesn't want to replace your screen doors. He actually does. He wants to take them all down and he wants to replace them with himself. He wants to be the door. And in making him the door, he's going to provide you with protection. He's going to provide you with provision. And he's going to provide you with a word that we're scared of nowadays called Prosperity. Protection, provision, and prosperity. So let's talk about Jesus gives us protection. Verse 1 of chapter 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. In verse 7, he makes it very clear. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. So Jesus is continuing to teach. And what he's doing is he's actually providing commentary for the events that happened in John chapter 9, which is a great chapter. I would encourage you to read it. You will if you're reading through John with us. In that story, there's a man who's born blind and he's been healed. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are upset about this. 
And so they call the man into question and they say, hey, were you really born blind? He's like, yeah, been blind my whole life. Now I'm not, Jesus did it. And they don't believe him. So they call his mom and dad in. And mom and dad do some A plus abdication of responsibility here. It's pretty amazing. They're scared that they're gonna get tossed out of the synagogue because that's what was happening to people who follow Jesus And so when they're asked, hey, was he really born blind? Their response is, he's an adult, ask him. So they go back to him and they're like, they're like, really? He's and he says this. This is such a great, I don't know if this was an ignorant comment on his part or if he was like actually kind of jabbing it in the ribs with him. And he says this, he's like, Yeah, he healed me. Do you guys want to be his disciple too? And they're just irate. They throw him out, they use the word cast out. It's the same word that's used when Jesus casts out a demon. They cast him out of the synagogue and Jesus finds him afterwards and says, do you wanna be my disciple? And he says, yeah, I wanna go with you. And so in John chapter 10, we're getting Jesus' thoughts, his commentary on what happens in John chapter nine. And we're, he uses an idea that we're not as familiar with because we're, most of us are not shepherds. I don't think any of us are, I'm willing to wager. Um, not much, but maybe it's a big room. Online doesn't count. Uh, if you're a shepherd watching this online from the comforts of your sheepfold, but in the, in the, in the outside, uh, in the, in the ancient Near East, what he would, they would do is they would put the sheep up in the middle of the night and they would keep them safe inside of a pen. And what they would do is sometimes, and, and again, we're using a metaphor here. So it's kind of fluid. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in, in those Gospels, Jesus uses parables. He does not use parables in the Gospel of John. Parables are a little bit more fixed. People have certain assigned roles, and they're a little easier to follow. Metaphors are a little more flexible and fluid. And so that's why in the same passage where Jesus says, I am the door, he can also say, I am the, the good shepherd, which is about to happen. You'll, you'll read about it next week. And so in this story, what's happening is they're either a, a, a sheep pen that's shared by a group of shepherds and at night they put all their sheep in there and they've hired a guy to watch the gate at night. Or it's one uh, shepherd with his sheep and there's a guy that's over it uh, and it's usually the shepherd himself. In either case, if you want to get in to get to the sheep and you're not supposed to be there, you have to go over the wall. You're a thief and a robber and you've gotta go over the wall to get to the sheep. And it should be obvious, based on what we just read in chapter 9, or what we just talked about in chapter 9, who's Jesus talking about? Who is he talking about here? The thieves and the robbers are the religious leaders. Because they're supposed to take care of the sheep. They're supposed to protect the sheep. They're supposed to watch over the sheep. And they're not doing it. Ezekiel chapter 34 is this great uh, picture of God being absolutely incensed. He's angry at the, at the shepherds of Israel, the kings and the religious leaders. They're supposed to take care of the sheep, but instead what they're doing is they're using the sheep to make themselves wealthy and fat and happy, taken care of. So he reprimands them. Thieves don't care what they do with your stuff. They don't care about your things. If a guy steals your money from you, he doesn't care that you worked hard to get it. He doesn't care that that was supposed to go to pay for your mortgage or your groceries. They steal your grandmother's ring. They don't care that it's a family heirloom. They don't care that you're going to have to pay to fix that broken window. They don't care. They care about what that thing is going to get them. It's a means to an end. And that's the way the religious leaders were viewing the people. That's the way the religious leaders were viewing. They're there for us. They're there to make us content and happy and to further our agenda. And Jesus is saying that he is there He's there to fix this abuse and extortion. He's there to be the good shepherd. And it's not because Jesus loves animals. He does. It's not because Jesus loves people. He does. It's because they're his sheep. They're my sheep. You don't treat my sheep that way. If I come over to your house and you have a dog and your dog starts barking at me and you kind of bop your dog on the nose and say, no, you'd be okay with that because you're the owner of the sheep. Do what you want with your dog. To an extent, I guess. I'm not a dog owner. I don't know. But if I come into your house and your dog stops barking at me and I bop your dog on the nose, I probably will not be invited back to your home unless you really just don't like your dog. Like, yeah. That's presumptive. These are his sheep. Jesus is there 
to protect them. The idea of God being a sheep shepherd, a refuge, a sheepfold, a place of protection for his people is all over the Old Testament. And it happens the most in the Psalms and in the prophets. The most famous one is Psalm 23, right? It's all about sheep and it's all about protection. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. It even says he prepares a place for me in front of my enemies. It's all about protection and it's all about being a shepherd. But there's other places too. It should be no surprise that the most emotive places in scripture, and by emotive and passionate, I mean the places where the author is writing from their emotions. He's not doing a theological treatise. He's not uh, uh, putting forward this idea that he wants you to consider like Paul sometimes does. It doesn't mean it's sound, uh, unsound theology. It just means that he's writing from an emotive place, a passionate place. And they're writing these things because when you are vulnerable, when you are exposed, when you are scared, you resort back to your emotions. You resort back to your feelings. You see the need for security, the need to protect our vulnerabilities. That's not just a need. It's a felt need. A felt need is something that we talked about a lot when I was in a preaching class. You don't just want people to feel something when you, or need something when you're hearing. You don't, they don't need to just cognitively be like, yeah, I need to hear this. They need to feel a need. They need to emotionally connect with the sermon. And so if you're exposed, if you're vulnerable, if you don't feel safe, if you need God's protection, that's a felt need. You long for it. Your prayers change dramatically when you are feeling the need of God. Then if you're just like, Lord, I need you. It's more than just a cognitive exercise. So it's not a surprise that the most passionate parts of Scripture are driven by need. Exposure and vulnerability are consequences of the fall. Adam and Eve were naked, but they weren't afraid. Why? Because God was their protector. He was their refuge. He was their security. But after they sin, after they fall, God is no longer their refuge and their security. In fact, God has become their enemy. Now, he still cares for them and provides for them. But he has to find a solution for this breach in the relationship. This is why Christ comes. Look, we know we're vulnerable. We've inherited vulnerability and nakedness and exposure from our first parents, Adam and Eve. It's why we put locks on our cars. It's why we put locks on our houses. It's why we put locks on our phone. I can't even open my wife's phone because I don't have her face. It's that secure. And thank the Lord that my wife doesn't look like me, right? We all know those couples, right, that look alike, and you're like, why, how? Sorry, side note. But it's not just our stuff, right? We insure things, so if something does happen to them, but again, it's not just stuff. Vulnerability is why I can't say I'm sorry when I know I'm wrong. When I know I messed up, it's why I can't say I'm sorry, it's why I won't ask for forgiveness. It's why I won't forgive. I know I'm exposed. I need security. I need comfort. And I'm not going to let that person back into my life. It's why when you were in high school or middle school and you thought somebody was cute, you had a crush on somebody, you didn't just saunter up to them and be like, hey, I think, you're, I think you're cute. We should go out sometime. I mean, maybe you did. And if you did, good for you. You're oozing with confidence. I was not. I asked people out looking at the floor. I found looking at the shoes was the best approach. Getting a date in high school. Vulnerability is the reason we tend to hang around people that look like us, talk like us, act like us. That's the herd mentality, and it's safe in the herd. People push back up against the idea that we are sheep, but we are. Vulnerability is part of our lives. It's part of who we are. Vulnerability is the reason, just forget about the locks, it's why we have doors at all. If I wasn't worried about somebody coming into my house and stealing my stuff, I wouldn't have a door. If I didn't have to protect myself from the elements, I wouldn't have a door. If I wasn't worried about the, you know, 600 pound mosquitoes we have in Texas, I wouldn't have a door. But we have doors for protection. This is why we let certain people get to know us and why we don't let other people get to know us. We're selective in who we let in. My wife and I call it flying the flag. 
If you tell somebody something that like, maybe you're a little embarrassed of, like I really like Star Wars, you can know that, it's okay. But if I share that a little too early in a relationship with somebody, Kim's like, oh, you flew that flag too early. She's like, you freaked them out. I was like, ah, no, I know, but I really like Star Wars. Vulnerability is a big thing with us, big thing. So when Jesus says he's saying, I'm the door, he's saying, I want to protect you. I want to watch over you. We had a discussion this week, Jeff, Rolando, and I, as we were preparing for the sermon, we were like, what is this about? Why does he say, I am the door? And then like five verses later, he says, I'm the good shepherd. And why is it so confusing? And I had to think about the relationship to chapter nine. And we thought about how he's saying that the thieves and robbers don't use the door. This is about protection. This is about security. And the things that we trust in that are not Jesus Christ, they are screen doors in places where we are underwater. Things that are supposed to protect us will fail if they are not Jesus Christ. The synagogue was supposed to protect the blind man. It didn't. The religious leaders were supposed to care for his family. They threatened them. The kings of Israel were supposed to care for Israel. They didn't. They abused them. And in our world, it's the same. Our governments fail to take care of us. It doesn't make the government bad. It makes it human. Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government there is except for every single other one we've tried. And it's because it's made up of people. It's flawed. You don't have to go back too far, 10 years, and see all the scandals that we have of people in power, CEOs, business leaders, actors, actresses, pastors, priests. I think police officers are fantastic people. I think most of them are very, very good and very good at their job and should be honored and respected. But like every institution made up of people, there are people that work there that aren't in it to protect people, aren't in it for the right reasons. And they hurt people out of that. Oftentimes our protectors wind up being the ones that hurt us and because we put too much stock in screen doors in places where we're underwater. And Jesus is saying is I'm the gate. I'm the place of security. You've got to trust me, you've got to put your faith in me. Those other doors, they only give the illusion of security. It's like that rickety old screen door on, a, on an old worn down house. That, like, the screen is like falling apart and you're like, that's not keeping any bugs out. That's barely keeping your dog out. It's huge. Jesus doesn't want to just come in and repair your rickety screen doors. He wants to replace your doors with himself. Because he wants to protect you because he cares for you because he loves you. He loves you. But doors just don't provide protection. If they did, they'd be walls. But we have to get out of the house, right? We have to traverse the threshold, right? And so Jesus gives us uh, another thing, just like doors give us something else. Jesus gives us protection. We get protection from Jesus. Verse 3 says, to him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Now, we need to make a confession here. We need a bit of humility. We don't know that much about shepherding, Okay? And if we did, we would think of it in a Western style of shepherding. We would think of it as uh, the shepherd standing behind the sheep and driving the sheep before him where they're supposed to go. Maybe you got a lucky, uh, a good little sheep dog right there with you to help you, and you're just walking along and you're, you're pushing the sheep. That's not the way it worked in the Near East and in the ancient Near East. Notice what it says in verse uh, 4. Sorry, verse 3. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. So in the ancient Near East, what would happen is, say you've got all those sheep in the same sheepfold, but they're owned, they're owned by different shepherds. The shepherds would all stand outside in different spots, and they would have a unique call that was just for their sheep, and they would make a unique kind of vocal call to their sheep, and their sheep would just trot out of the gate and go right to the shepherd. There was no need to tag them or mark them or anything like that because the sheep know the voice of their shepherd. And then, rather than drive the sheep before them, the shepherd would have them follow him. He's their shepherd. They walk behind him. We know this to be true, right? One of the first things you learned as a kid was Mary had a little lamb 
And what did that little lamb do? It followed her to school one day. Tagged right along. Made the children laugh and play, I've heard. The first thing is they hear his voice. You see, everything that the sheep need is provided by one thing, their relationship to the shepherd. Their identity is derived from the shepherd. They are his sheep. And because they are his sheep, he gives them access to the sheepfold. They're not his sheep. They're not going in the sheepfold. He gives them access to the pastures. You're not coming with me if you're not my sheep. Everything they need is derived from being his sheep. They get their identity from him. Now, it sounds like we're bleeding over into the good shepherd idea. I get that. In fairness, Jesus kind of bleeds over into it too. We're just following the text. But you derive your identity from your door as well. Doors give us identities. On your home, where you live, there is a little number on the outside of your door. It's attached to a street name. And then a city and a state and a zip code. The number on your door gives you an identity. And maybe you give your identity to the number on the door. But you get packages delivered to that number. We live in a very delivery-oriented society now. Stuff comes into my home through that door with the number on it. I get my groceries ever since the pandemic. We don't do grocery stores anymore. They come to us. It's fantastic. Until I have to put it all up, and then it's not as fantastic. We still haven't figured that one out yet. We get a lot of stuff. You can tell a lot about a person by what's delivered to their home, right? I mean, I don't think you should sit outside and watch what comes in and out of somebody's door. That's creepy. But if you could, what would you do? What would you see? You would see what people want, what people need. You'd see whether they're poor or rich. You'd see whether they work all day away from home or whether they work from home or whether they have a job at all. You'd see if they live alone or if they have family or a roommate. You'd see everything about them just by them coming in and out of the door. Because that number, that door, gives them an identity. It's their number. We derive our identity from the door. And so what we traverse the door to see what we go in and out of. That's what gives us our identity too. The thing that gets you up in the morning, that gets you out of bed, that makes life worth living, that puts your feet on the ground and says, yeah, I'm gonna go live life today and I'm gonna go out that door and I'm gonna come back. What, what sends you out the door and what draws you back in at home each night, that is your identity. That's the most important thing about you. What motivates you? What drives you? This is what Jesus has for us. What goes in and out. Your identity. It makes up your livelihood. And in, in, in the story here today, the door, the gate, it's this transitional barrier. You go from security to provision. Doors give us access to things, right? Right? Some of us have opened doors to things when we were kids or when we were younger. It's led to some addictions and things in our life now that we wish weren't there. We keep trying to close that door and it keeps flying open on us. Maybe we've accessed things that we don't want to. We've committed ourselves to things that we wish we hadn't. You see, Jesus wants to give you a new identity. He wants to give you a new door. He wants to give you a new number on that door. Jesus is asking to come in. Revelation 3.20 is a really famous passage of scripture. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. I think there's two things interesting about this passage for our purposes today. One is that he writes this to a group of Christians in a place called Laodicea. And at Laodicea, they were lukewarm. This is the famous passage where Jesus says, if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. And the reason why they were lukewarm is they thought they could take care of their prosperity on their own. They thought, I'm rich, we're rich, we can take care of our own needs. We don't need Jesus. They didn't have that felt need. Jesus was not their door. 
The second thing that I think is interesting about this is that they stand, he stands at the door and he knocks. And why does he knock? What does he want to do? Does he want to come in and turn over their lives and come in and, and kick their tails and tell them you guys are messed up and you're doing everything wrong and you're supposed to be my church? No. What does he want to do? He wants to come in and eat with them. He wants to dine with them. He's like DoorDash, but way better. He wants to meet with them. Just live life with them. He wants to dwell with them. And I think it's interesting that he knocks. Jesus, the most powerful being, doesn't batter the door down, doesn't yell the door down. He just knocks. He waits for you to open. Open your door to Christ. Let him come in. Let him dine with you. And then listen to him as he tells you what doors need to be replaced and where because he wants to give you security and he wants to give you provision. He wants to provide for you. So where does this lead us? Well, it leads us to, like I said, a word that we're scared of and it's prosperity. Verse seven. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep and all who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, and I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So one of the mistakes that we make when we read this passage is in verse 9. He says, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Now we like that. We like the way that sounds because we understand eternal life to be something that happens after we die. I pray a prayer. I trust that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and I'm good to go. I walked an aisle one time, and then I'm just a good person, and I'm saved. I'm in the sheepfold. Things are good. But Jesus then does this really annoying thing where he keeps talking after we've stopped listening. And he says in verse 9, they'll be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Well, wait a minute, Travis. Isn't being in the sheepfold being saved, like going in and out? Am I losing my salvation? Does Jesus want me to do that? Am I running away? What what does this mean? Too many gray areas. I can't deal with this. Saved means saved. I don't think that's what Jesus has in mind here. You gotta think about the context. You gotta think about what's going on. If Jesus is the gate, he's this transitional barrier, right? He's the one who lets us in and lets us out. And he says that he's come to give us life and to give it abundantly. You see, for a sheep to have an abundant life, a sheep can't stay in the sheepfold. And for a sheep to have an abundant life, it can't stay in the pasture either. Life is found in the traversal of the doorway, of the gate. From safety to provision, from provision to safety, back and forth, back and forth. And the one in charge of that is the shepherd, is the gate. The shepherd is the gate because the shepherd is the one that says, open it, let him out. Or open them, they got to come back in. The shepherd is the one who knows when it's safe to be out in the fields and eating. And the shepherd is the one who knows when it's safe, when they need to go back to the sheep pen. The shepherd is the one who knows. And this traversal from provision to security and back again, that's what prosperity is. That's what prosperity is in the gospel. It is trusting Jesus Christ to tell you when to go out and when to come in. When to take a risk and when to play it safe. When to go out and when to come in. That is what Jesus being your door is. But so many of us want the keys to the gate. We want to control the locks. Sheep don't have pockets. Where are you going to put the keys, guys? Jesus. Jesus is the one you need. He is the one who gives you the wisdom to know when to go out and when to go in. And we say, oh, but I don't want to take that risk. I don't want to forgive that person. I don't want to trust that person. And Jesus says, it's okay. You can come out of the sheep pen. You're never going to find provision hiding away in the sheep pen. Or we say, oh, but Jesus, the pasture is so great. I can do all this stuff. I can hang around with these people. Or I can can take these risks. Or I can live this way and it's okay. It's not going to burn me. And Jesus is like, there's wolves out there. You need to come back to the sheep pen with me. But we don't listen because we want to be in control of the gate. We want to lock and open the door. So what do we do with this? How do we make Jesus our door? How do we give him the keys? Faith 
and time. Faith and time. There's something that I, I haven't addressed yet, and it's the thieves and robbers. Before you can become a sheep of Christ, you have to recognize something about yourself first. You're a thief and you're a robber. Because what we do is when we don't have a relationship with Christ, we hop fences into other people's sheep pens. We take their joy, we take their happiness, we take their stuff, all so that we can feel fulfilled, all so that we can feel good about ourselves, so, we, so that we have significance. We do it all the time. And we do it in ways we don't even understand or realize. And so until you recognize that your natural tendency is to be a thief and a robber, you'll never be a sheep and you'll never belong in any sheepfold. You'll always be an imposter. But Christ has come. He was crucified, buried, and resurrected to turn thieves and robbers into good, fluffy little sheep. And I know this because Jesus was crucified in between two robbers. And one of them said, when you come into your kingdom, I want you to remember me, which is the dumbest act of faith, to trust somebody who's clearly on their last legs and their kingdom doesn't look like it's coming at all. But he understood something, that the sheepfold and the kingdom was greater than just this life here. He let Jesus be his doorway into prosperity and provision and security. And Jesus said, what? Today you'll be with me in paradise, a place where there's provision, there's pr protection, and there's prosperity. You need faith. You've got to trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have to. But then also, you need time. You need to spend time with Jesus. One of the nasty things we had reinforced to us during the pandemic was that doorways are gross. Doorknobs are nasty. They're full of germs because you touch them, and then you wipe your nose, and then you touch them again. And then I wipe my nose, and I touch them, and we just swap germs on doorknobs. You get infected. If you want to become more like Christ, if you want to grow in a relationship with him, you have to spend time with him. You've got to constantly touch the door. You've got to be in contact with the door so that you can get infected with your Christ-likeness. Just keep touching the door. Pray to him throughout your day. Little sentence prayers, long prayers, doesn't matter. Talk to him, cry out to him, even when you don't feel like it. Be in the word, do dwell readings with us. Touch the door. Get infected with Christ. And let him come into your life and change the doors. Let him give you protection. Let him give you provision. Let him give you prosperity because he loves you. And you can do that today and you do that every single day for the rest of your life. Christianity is just going through your house and finding all the places you've got rickety old screen doors that aren't keeping the water out and calling Jesus and saying, Jesus, I don't know how to fix this. Jesus, I don't know how to follow you at work. Show me. I don't know how to follow you in my family. Show me. I don't know how to follow you in my personal life. I don't know how to follow you in my sex life. I don't know how to follow you with my money. And Jesus comes in and it's like, well, let's replace that door. Let's do it. Remember, he was a carpenter. He probably worked with a lot of doors. He wants to give you protection, provision, and prosperity. And he wants to start today. The remodel starts today, people. Let him come in. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace to us. Thank you for your mercy. And we thank you that you are a really, really compassionate God who cares for us and loves us and forgives us. When we misspeak, when we are unclear, when we hurt others, pray that you'd be gracious. Pray that you would provide for us and protect us. I pray that you would help us to close doors that have been open for too long. I pray that you would replace them with yourself. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.